I'm Lauren Thomas, uh, Chief Medical Officer or uh, Medical Director. Um, I have a few slides to share with you just uh, around patient safety. Uh, an apology beforehand, I've just realised I'm reflecting on my slides. I can't do I can't do slides without a good graph. Um, so the first of these really is to illustrate um, our journey with regards to patient safety. So um, clearly the importance of patient safety. Uh, for our trust is something that's really taken precedence in the last few years. Uh, and as a learning organisation, what you are looking for um, is uh, an organisation that will report uh, when things go wrong uh, and learn from it. Uh, the graph behind us really shows the green line uh, is our number of incidents by level of harm. And th those, the green line uh, illustrates those incidents that uh, have caused little, minimal or no harm and clearly that is a very significant difference between that and the red line which is our harm incidents. They are no less important of course but I think the, the point I'm trying to illustrate here is if we are reporting sufficiently on our incidents on all of them when things don't go as they're planned then clearly we can demonstrate that we're learning from the errors. Similarly, yet another graph, I apologise. I think it's just to illustrate the point further. Um, we are uh, one of the highest reporting organisations in the NHS when it comes to safety incidents. Uh, and that's not to suggest at all that we are unsafe or any less safe than any other organisation. My argument is that we are safer than others because of our reporting um, tradition uh, and because of our uh, embedded learning in reflecting when things don't go as planned. We are the red line, the national average of reporting is the blue line. Uh, so we do have very consistent levels of reporting. We are safety focused, uh, which is at the heart really of what we do in terms of our care for patients. And I think the most important thing really is for us to be in a position where we are learning, we have a safe learning culture for our staff, uh, and that we don't find ourselves in a position where the same error occurs. Um, this is further demonstrated in some of our staff reporting. So from our staff surveys, you can tell from the statistics behind me that we are clearly uh, an organisation which is moving in the right direction uh, when we think about our staffs feeling engaged and our staff feeling that they can actively report uh, and feel a part of changes in response to incidents. Um, just a, a quick word on the Centre for Perfect Care. So the Centre for Perfect Care, as you may have heard previously, it is our quality improvement centre uh, and it is of course aligned with some of our zero aspiration goals. Um, we do have an aspiration to clearly expand further on this. We have 400 staff currently trained specifically in quality improvement methodology uh, and it's their role to work in services to look at continuous improvement. Um, QI, is, quality improvement is something that clearly we have embedded in all our leadership programmes anyway. We have 80 teams actively registered as having a QI project uh, ongoing and the aspiration of course is that we get to a position where each and every clinical team has an active quality improvement project ongoing. Just as, as an example of what can be achieved through some of this, um, we've seen a significant reduction in falls, 60% reduction in falls in fact, uh, along our house, uh, and that has been a direct result of some of the work that we've done through our quality improvement methodology. Uh, and, and similarly, you'll see the statistics there, we have clearly focused much of our effort on restrictive practice, as you're aware, uh, and we've seen a 30% reduction uh, in restraint, uh, with a 12% reduction in staff assaults over the last uh, review period. I include this report, uh, this graph here, uh, as an illustration of where we're at for Mersey Care. Uh, and I caveat that, of course, with these are not just numbers, uh, these are people, uh, and these are lives lost. Uh, this is the pattern, uh, regrettably, that we have seen uh, for our patients in our care. 2018 to 2020. You can see there are fluctuations there. You can see that there are associations with COVID. 
Um, our aspiration, of course, is to get to a position where we have zero suicides. Uh, and this is clearly uh, one of the most important tasks for me as a medic, but also for our clinicians working in our mental health uh, division to focus their efforts on driving those numbers forward and, and lower. Um, we have clearly seen some improvements. We are falling below the baseline on some of these statistics, both uh, locally and nationally, but clearly there is more to do. Um, and clearly this is going to be the focus of our work over the next uh, 12 months. Just some more illustrative graphs, again apologies for the graphs, um, just demonstrating the patterns that we've seen uh, in suicides. We look and analyse this in great detail, as I'm sure you'd expect. Um, we look at some of the issues that have contributed or that we could have done differently and we learn from them. The trend there clearly shows a peak um, associated with COVID and whilst that wasn't seen nationally, it is something that we've seen um, in Cheshire and Merseyside. Uh, the numbers have reduced but clearly they are still at a significant number, they are not zero of course. Um, and this is clearly uh, an example I think of our ongoing efforts really in this regard. Um, just a final slide then for me. Joe mentioned this earlier on and it is about our research achievements and our ambition more importantly. I'm not going to go through the boxes specifically in detail. Um, it's something that both Joe and I feel very strongly about, um, particularly with regards to the availability of clinical trials uh, for our patients. It's, it's what really drives us to get to a very different position uh, from a research ambition for the Trust. Um, I'm pleased to say that we are in a position now that we're offering more clinical trials to our patients than we have ever done before. Um, it's still a small handful and the aspiration clearly is for more. Um, we are probably at around four or five clinical trials open currently, uh, specifically targeting mental health, targeting depression, targeting psychosis, but also, as you can see there, a clinical trial uh, associated with the treatment of long COVID. So not exclusively limited to, to mental health, but obviously covering the breadth of the services that we offer. Um, just in final, really, a, a recognition that this is a journey for us, particularly around research. We have um, recruited very positively uh, a chair in mental health to the University of Liverpool. We've not had that for many, many years, and that will make a significant impact for us uh, moving forwards. Um, I think the other point I wish to make really is the importance for me uh, of ensuring that we capture evidence and the data to show that our care and treatment makes difference to patients. Uh, if it doesn't make a difference, I'm not interested. I am interested in making people better. That is why we're all here, essentially. Um, and a lot of our focus over the next 12 months, we may to start this year, will be about capturing outcomes uh, and measuring our success in improving health and well-being. In that regard, with regard to research, uh, we are now looking at expanding quite a lot of our research to include service users and carers and training uh, around their involvement in qualitative research so that we can actually demonstrate that we're making a difference. Um, I have nothing further to add. I think that's uh, where we're at in terms of our quality research.